I'm going to turn the program over to Nancy A. Strike, Division Director of Diversity and Workforce Services here at OSHR, and she is going to introduce Barbara Gibson, State Human Resources Director. Nancy. Thank you, Wendy, and welcome to everyone joining us today for this event. Appointed by Governor Roy Cooper as Director of the North Carolina Office of State Human Resources in January of 2017, Barbara Gibson is dedicated to ensuring a fair, welcoming, and inclusive workplace for all state government employees. Director Gibson has overseen the first comprehensive overhaul of the statewide compensation system since 1949. The system is better aligned with North Carolina's competitive job market and bolstered by policy updates that provide agencies increased flexibility. She is also working to modernize the state's aging human capital management system, which is essential to providing accurate, real-time data for informed decision-making. The Cooper administration has issued several executive orders, many of which specifically improve the employment experience for women. As OSHR director, Director Gibson is charged with overseeing the implementation of these important initiatives for all state employees. She will tell you more about some of them shortly. Prior to joining OSHR, Director Gibson led the Human Resources Office of the North Carolina Department of Justice for 16 years under then Attorney General Cooper. She also served eight years as the Human Resources Director at the North Carolina Department of Labor. Director Gibson also held various human resources roles in the private sector, including at IBM and General Mills corporate headquarters. But she shared with us that undoubtedly her favorite work experience was with the Walt Disney Company. Director Gibson has a master's degree in industrial relations from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. So please join me this afternoon in welcoming State Human Resources Director, Barbara Gibson. Barbara? Thank you, Nancy, and good afternoon, everyone. It is such an honor to introduce our guest today, Gloria Steinem. As a HR professional, focusing on the impact of her work on the workplace is really most compelling to me, but really and truly, she's been a beacon of the feminist movement dating back to the 1960s and 70s. Think how brave that was back in those decades to be in front of the feminist movement. I also thought from a work standpoint about when my children were young and now they're in college, of course, but I always look forward to the day where we could take our children to work. We all have Gloria Steinem to thank for helping to institute this experience for countless families across the United States in 1992, when it was first known as Take Your Daughter to Work Day. In general though, her advocacy work has really helped shine the light on systems that kept women from kept women from being fully and equitably valued members of the workplace and really throughout society. It is my very great pleasure today to welcome Ms. Steinem as our distinguished speaker for today's EEO Lunch and Learn webinar in recognition of the 49th anniversary of Women's Equality Day. Note, she is largely responsible for making Ms. a standard courtesy title that made marital status less important than respect for all women as individuals. Ms. Steinem's contributions to feminism internationally as a writer, a lecturer, an organizer, and a media spokeswoman on issues of equality can't be overstated. Early in her trailblazing career, she was founder of New York, and Ms. Magazines, the Feminist Majority Foundation, the National Women's Political Caucus, and the Ms. Foundation for Women. Decades later, the still outspoken advocate has continued to make significant contributions, writing books, producing documentaries, receiving the Pre Presidential Medal of Freedom, and supporting budding activists and organizations. Her impact in society is reflected in many of Governor Cooper's priorities for North Carolina. Governor Cooper, who has appointed the most diverse cabinet in North Carolina history, including women in key leadership positions throughout his administration, believes that our, sta our state's 5.2 million women deserve equal opportunity, 
equal pay, and equal respect. Ms. Steinem, I'm sure you will appreciate some of Governor Cooper's recent actions to support North Carolina women. After the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, he issued an executive order that takes several steps to defend access to reproductive health services in North Carolina. He addressed the gender pay gap through a salary adjustment fund and eliminating the use of salary history to determine fair compensation to state government employees. He provided paid parental leave to eligible state employees and supports pregnant employees with needed workplace protections. And of course, proclaiming Women's Equality Day to stand with women across the state and nation and encourage residents to commend and support organizations and activities that advocate for so social progress and equality for all. These and other actions to support women and girls in North Carolina are of critical importance, not only to their well being, but also to the quality of life for all North Carolinians. These are among the topics that Gloria Steinem has championed throughout her life. Ms. Steinem, thank you again for joining us today. We are thrilled you accepted this invitation to speak in, in celebration of the 49th anniversary of Women's Equality Day. Now, today's conversation will be facilitated by our very own female, North Carolina Department of Administration Secretary, Pamela Brewington Cashwell. Governor Cooper appointed Secretary Cashwell in April of 2021. She is the first American Indian woman to head a state cabinet department in our state's history. She oversees the agency whose mission is to serve as the business manager for the state of North Carolina and a voice for underserved communities throughout its advocacy programs, including the North Carolina Council for Women and Youth Involvement. In her role as secretary, she chairs initiatives such as the North Carolina Commission on Inclusion, the Andrea Harris no, no, Equity no, Task Force, no, no, no. and she serves on the North she Carolina Commission on Inclusion. Prior to her appointment as VO Secretary, I've seen colleagues served as senior policy advisor and chief deputy secretary of the North Carolina Department of Safety. Oh, right. Just and before joining DPS, she was the assistant director at the State Ethics Commission. She also served for 10 years yes, as the federal yes. government as a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division and the Office of Justice Programs at the University Department of Justice, as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Virginia. She holds a JD from the UNC School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Cashel who will interview our very special guest, Ms. Gloria Stein. Pam? Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that introduction. And um, let me just say, I am so excited. I mean, I've just been sort of bubbling around my office all morning because this is such an incredible opportunity for me. and. Um, Gloria Steinem, I'm going to address you as Ms. Steinem, if that's okay for you. No, I'm, please, please just say Gloria. All okay. right. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll do. I, I hope that means that we're friends. Now, I'm going to say that, that we're friends. I just got to call you Gloria. And so, um, anyway, I'm so excited for you to be here with us. And I'm particularly excited as we um, celebrate Women's Equality Day, which of course was Friday. To have you here, and if you can, you all for housekeeping, if you can please mute yourself. Um, Wendy, I know you're trying to get slides straight, but I think that you keep unmuting yourself um, so that we don't get feedback. So we have about an hour to um, talk through some questions, Gloria. And um, as I started to say, I'm super excited to have you here because your lifetime of work has focused not just on equality, for women, but um, really intersectional feminism, which deals, of course, with all types of discrimination women face, not just gender, but race, sexuality, socioeconomic status, physical ability, and other marginalized um, identities that are just so important to really having a um, more robust and thorough conversation 
about these issues that, of course, do directly impact women. So with that, I'm just going to jump right into questions. If that if that works for you, of course. Yeah. OK, so <clears throat> excuse me. As we're celebrating Women's Equality Day and the 102nd anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which, of course, we all know gave women the right to vote. What do you think that leading suffragists to include your, pater your paternal grandmother, who I read served as president of the Ohio Women's Suffrage Association in the early 1900s, what do you think that they would say about the state of women today? Well, hard to project, isn't it, what they would feel, but I think they would be probably grateful and surprised and angry at the same time. You know, uh, they might well have imagined complete success with no necessity for a movement by this time. Uh, but on the other hand, we have progressed a long way toward viewing people as unique individuals without adjectives. And so in that regard, what do you think is our benchmark? for success in having achieved gender equality? You know, there are probably benchmarks uh, that exist in the lives of many women and men that I don't know, but I would say that equal pay is the most obvious one and equal parenthood is the one least talked about. Because, you know, as long as women are more responsible for raising infants and little children than men are, then men will both have an advantage in the workplace and be deprived of that enormous pleasure uh, and the uh, developing of empathy and patience and all the things that come with being raised to raise children. Absolutely, and equal parenthood is a really tough one um, to get to. Do you have specific policy ideas around that and how we move um, more toward equal parenthood? Well, the most obvious one is parental leave rather than maternity leave. And I think that, you know, you are already there. Uh, but there are many more uh, cultural and psychological needs of ways that we move forward. I think the pandemic has helped somewhat because more men have been home with their families and therefore more likely to be able to identify with nurturing children, to nurture children, to understand how important it is, how rewarding, how complicated. Uh, women have had, up to then perhaps had more chance to see what it was like in the paid workforce than men had had to see what it was like to be an equal nurturer and child rear at home. Um, I think you're right. And what are your thoughts in terms of telework and whether that will be our future going forward in order to help um, sort of support this idea of equal parenthood? Well, it, uh, certainly that is helpful as an option, but it worries me if we turn to it too completely because it turns out that we can't empathize with each other. We can learn intellectually, uh, we can understand, you know, very, very crucial to be together as you and I are together now. But unless we're together in the same room, we can't empathize. The, the production of oxytocin in our brains, which is what happens if we see someone having an accident and we feel the impulse to help them, even if we don't know them, that is oxytocin. I don't think the human race could have survived without it. And it is limited by on screen contact. Thank you for that. I will be using that because I'm a, um, I have lots of staff who are probably watching this right now. And, and they're, I have a feeling sitting there saying, oh boy, we're going to hear that one again because um, I feel <laughs> that way very much. That well, I, uh, think, I think a lot of, um, you know, in the workplace, we, uh, we recognize this by having caucuses or 
employment groups or just sitting around a table in a circle rather than a hierarchy. You know, we, we I think, instinctively recognize it. I agree. So I'm going to turn to politics a little bit. Here in North Carolina, our legislature, and actually in Congress as well, still does not reflect um, the world that we live in, the, the state that we live in, the country that we live in. What are your thoughts about how we continue making progress toward getting women into elected and appointed positions? Well, the first thing is what you just said, looking at Congress, looking at our state legislatures and realizing if they don't look like the country, they don't look like the state, then we probably are not living in a democracy. This means uh, reaching out to uh, individuals who would be good candidates, but perhaps given the culture have just not thought of themselves as, as running. They're on the school board, but they don't perhaps think about uh, being a member of the state legislature or, or of Congress. Uh, it's, um, and that is the task of political parties, but also every community group. Uh, you know, all of us just need to simply look at at who's uh, at, at the state legislature and at Congress and say, wait a minute, it doesn't look like the country. Something is wrong. Um, indeed, and maybe that's where some of that equal parenting comes in as well, because I know for women who have children, it is very difficult to leave their families to, for example, in North Carolina to come to Raleigh to serve for an extended mm -hmm. period of time. Um, yes, all these things, all these things are connected. Yes. Yeah. So right now we're in a period where women in some cases are at odds with each other. Um, some are angry, many are outraged yet. Of course, some are celebrating because the glass ceiling um, or many glass ceilings are being shattered with a lot, a lot of first that are being celebrated for women in this country. But others argue that the setbacks in women's rights, sexual politics, battles against sexual harassment, and those sorts of things have really hurt women in incomparable ways. Can you speak about this moment that we're in right now and what it says about not just women, but our society as a whole? And I know that's a very packed question. Mm -hmm. Well, you started out by saying that women are opposed to each other. I I have not seen that so much. I mean, I'm sure it exists, but actually the huge majority of women seems to agree on equal pay and uh, reproductive rights and access to political office. So, you know, I'm I'm what you say exists, but I don't think that it includes enough women in opposition to women's equality to make the difference. And so, well, that's encouraging. And, and I, I think you're right. I guess the women who are um, sometimes the ones who are speaking in opposition of what the majority are saying can sometimes well, tend, tend to get was, the camera and the and be the loudest, and so that yeah, that that was true in the Phyllis Schlafly era. She was famously against the Equal Rights Amendment and mm -hmm. against equality for women. Um, but that was actually uh, supported by the John Birch Society, not by huge numbers of women. And it there's not a similar figure, as far as I know, in the nationally known today. So let's talk about the word feminist. Um, certainly, uh, it has taken on various meanings over time, sometimes um, negative, often empowering, sometimes polarizing, uh, maybe now occasionally viewed by some as outdated, obsolete. What is your definition of feminist and has that definition evolved over time? A feminist is simply someone, female or male, who believes in the full social, economic, political equality of males and females. 
we actually shouldn't need a word. I mean, you know, this should be just a given, but it is still an, rare enough. So many of us are both honored to be identified as feminists and feel that we should uh, identify ourselves in that way. Uh, some people say humanist, but historically that means that you don't believe in God. Um, you know, so that historically at least has had an additional meaning. So let's talk about books because you have written so many, many, many outstanding books and articles um, as a journalist and an author. Do you have a favorite book that you've written? Is there one of yours that is your favorite? Um, and if you're willing to say, do you have a favorite book um, by someone else that's had a profound impact on you? Well, books are like children, you know, I mean, it's very hard to say which one, you know, that you like the best. And uh, also for writers, we're also constantly aware of how we could have made it better, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, but in terms of favorite books, I would say anything by Alice Walker. I think she has a gift for going deep and wide and uh, inspiring us. And funny and serious all at the same time. I agree. Um, so, well, who are your role models? Do you, do you have any role models that you either did look up to or still do? Uh, well, when I was growing up, my role model was Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little Women. <laughs> she, which, you know, and actually she was uh, what we would now call a feminist and, and was a suffragist and so on. And, and Little Women is an interesting book because it is one in which all the major characters are women and it's a world unto itself. It portrays a civil war era in which the men were gone. So... Uh, it creates a, a, a world of women. Um, but otherwise, it's hard to pick a book, don't you think? It's sort of like choosing a, a, a favorite child. <laughs> but as I was saying, if I pick an author, it would be Alice Walker. Okay. So, I mean, you've had such a huge impact now, um, gosh, over more than 50 years and, and have been a major voice for women, um, an advocate. Do you believe that there's um, someone today who is a voice today? Not that you are not continuing to be that, but do you feel like there is someone today who is a voice that is capturing this this moment in time? No, there are hundreds. I mean, the, the only reason you know me is because I'm a, a journalist, a writer, so it's the way I work. Uh, but there are hundreds, thousands of, of women uh, in your community, uh, in Congress, you know, who, who are um, leading us. And it's probably a sign of the bad old days that there were fewer of us then. Now there are multitudinous names. Um. I'm going to turn back to politics a little bit. Do you feel like we can achieve bipartisan support on, and I know there are some issues where we have received, have achieved bipartisan support on some women's issues, but um, obviously there are others in the current um, wins before us that don't appear to have bipartisan support. What are your views about that? Do you feel like, I mean, on certain issues, it has felt like we made progress and now we're obviously not, um, we're maybe moving in the wrong direction. Do you think we can achieve bipartisan support on some of these women's issues? And if so, how do we- Yes, do absolutely. I mean, in the same way that there uh, should be and sometimes is bipartisan support for doing away with racism, there should be bipartisan support for doing away with sexism. Um, you know, unfortunately, President Trump did not agree with that. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what he actually believed, but he cast his lot anyway with people who, who didn't believe in that. 
but that should be our bottom line, you know, that um, uh, according to our, who were our forefathers, unfortunately not our foremothers, but <laughs> we are all created equal. So for those who say that um, more progress for women um, comes at a cost to men or that it hurts men, and, and that argument is frequently expressed um, in the same way, unfortunately, that it's, it's expressed in other areas like issues for education and um, providing opportunities for more diverse student bodies and that sort of thing. What what do you say to those who feel like progress for women hurts men? Um, I would say, what is your definition of manhood? Is it being a full human being or is it being a patriarch? If it's a patriarch, then that's an expectation of dominance that I think is unfair and undemocratic. So you know, it hurts the idea of patriarchy, but I don't think it hurts men to, for instance, be able to raise and care for their own children just as much as women do, because as men discover, it develops a whole part of them, a whole uh, empathy, patience, you know, delight, <laughs> which has been interesting in this past year or more of being of people being at home because i think it, clearly more men have discovered um what it's like to raise children to be intimate with their own children and how rewarding that is and more men are insisting therefore on parental leave not just maternity leave do you think also gloria that that's breaking down some of those stereotypes that we've traditionally had about the roles for um men versus women do you do you feel like it's having an impact yes in i way? hope so i hope so because i mean the when we arrive here on earth as infants <laughs> we are unique human beings we are someone who could never have happened before in exactly the same way and could never happen again in exactly the same way so to have a stereotypical cutout of an outline imposed on this unique human being just because it's a male baby or a female baby or a baby of color or white color, you know makes no sense it inhibits and punishes everyone uh, absolutely. Um, so people talk a lot about what denigrates women and and the sort of spectrum of things that um, comes up in that category. What what do you think most denigrates women and why? Probably because uh, we have one thing uniquely that men don't, which is wombs. <laughs> the the all the ideas that try to confine us because we have wombs uh, then turns us into less than a unique human being. We should be free to give birth or not give birth, to, depending on you know what what we wish. Uh, men should be free to nurture children, to have children, to care about you, or or not, depending on what they wish it, it robs us and it robs men of uniqueness um so what are some things then that both women and men can do to support women some of those very specific practical feasible um things wherever we work whether it's an office or a factory or wherever it is we can uh, look at the people around us and see if men and women, people of color, white people, are, who do the same task, mm -hmm. uh, the same level of expertise, are earning the same thing. We can make sure that men have parental leave. As it's not just women who get <laughs> maternity leave. Um, 
just, you know, it's very important that we change what is around us because where what's close to us is an area of our greatest power. And not only that, it's fun and rewarding, <laughs> you know, and just, you know, talking to two or three other people about what doesn't seem fair and fixing it is incredibly rewarding. Right. Uh, absolutely. I, I agree. And and gratefully, um, I do feel like we're in a time where lots of those things are happening. As Barbara mentioned, lots of um, great policies in North Carolina that are happening, which well, I'm going to go back to that policy side. Um, we've talked a little bit about some policy, some policies that are already in existence, but are there any other kind of easy, I use that word loosely, policy engagement opportunities that you think are particularly relevant to women? We, to women? We've talked about parental leave already. Are there any others that you want to add to that that uh, because normally those policies don't just benefit women. Obviously, they benefit everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so are there any others that you would add to that? There's, I would say that there's another very simple one, which is the politics of talking and listening. You know, and, and do are those equal when, when we sit in a uh, employee meeting or a boardroom? Are we participating equally? Uh, you know, or is it sort of by our group, you know, um, it, which is good for the workplace because the workplace needs to have the suggestions, intelligence, innovations of all of its workers, not just the few on top. It, and the simple act of sitting in a circle instead of sitting in rows, I've seen that transform classrooms just moving chairs to sit in a circle and doing what Native Americans did, which is to pack a, pass a talking stick around mm -hmm. so that each person has a chance to speak while all listen. And this goes around in a circle. That simple thing profoundly changes a group. Absolutely, thank you for that. Okay, so if you could go back in time now to your um, younger self, say 15 to 20, um, what would you tell young women of, the, of that age group? Uh, what would you tell them based on, you know, all of your experience and knowledge that you've gained now about um, just advice to them? What, what advice would you give women of that? Well, first of all, I'm not sure they need my advice, but, <laughs> but, but I would say, what do you love to do so much that you forget what time it is when you're doing it? That probably is an indication of what your unique talents are, what your interests are, and follow that and find people, hang out with people who support you in that. So I'm curious, would that advice change any if you were um, speaking to your 30 to 40 year old self? Or would it be the same? Uh, well, that's interesting. I think, you know, remember how old I am. So I think <laughs> I was still, uh, I think I was always rebelling, but quietly. So I hope no one would notice. So <laughs> it wasn't until the civil rights movement and the women's movement and the anti-war movement, all those things came along that I felt there was uh, companionship and it was okay, you know, to say what you uniquely felt. Awesome. Well, talking about your long and um, very storied career that you've had, is there a single moment that stands out for you that was a defining moment in your life that you feel like sort of changed your trajectory? Hmm. Well, for, for me, this may be uh, unique to me because I had been uh, a freelance writer who never had a job, actually. <laughs> you know? So 
when the, a group of us gathered together and said the faithful words, oh, let's create a magazine, Ms. Magazine, that was my first group effort. And in that, I was, I found a community uh, quite different from sitting at home at your desk all the time. <laughs> um, so I began to find what I think is helpful, which is a balance between your unique individual work and working in a group. We are, after all, communal animals. We need each other. Mm -hmm. Well, and at that, do you, did, did you feel like that was the point where, I mean, I know you had done a lot of writing before Ms. Magazine, but did you feel like that that was a point where you like really found your voice to be able to get that out incredibly broadly through that and, and give other women a voice? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I found a community uh, before I had been working in a more isolated way as a writer, sometimes going to editorial meetings at New York Magazine, which I helped to start, but um, mostly working at home. And it's it's great to be in a, a group in that way because somebody says something that sparks something in somebody else. As long as the group is not hierarchical, but is circular, it's very helpful because you get support, you get inspiration, uh, and you can you can experience leaps forward in what's possible. Uh, there is nothing better in um, life and certainly in your work life, I, I truly believe, than being in a work situation where you are in a team, even familial sort of situation where everyone is equal and everyone has a voice and everyone is appreciates being challenged by other voices. Um, that's an amazing experience when you can get that. It's a, it really it is an amazing experience. And, and I, I, I learned from the great Cherokee chief, Wilma Mankeller, who's no longer with us, that this is vertical history. I mean, in this country, <laughs> which was Native American before European showed up and before hierarchical religion showed up. Uh, this was the way people met and communicated. So there were circles and then there were concentric circles. And finally, there was a longhouse, you know, that was called the longhouse, but actually it was circular too. So it, it's, um, it doesn't mean that we're isolated in one circle. It means we are contributing upward. So, um, Gloria, I don't know if you call that Barbara said that I'm um, American Indian. I'm from the Lumbee and Kohari tribes here in North Carolina. But at some point, I would love to have a conversation because I love your knowledge of uh, Native American history in this country. Well, it isn't. I mean, it, it, it wasn't book learning. It was because Wilma Mankell was on the board of the Ms. Foundation and she became a dear friend and I went to stay there. You, you know, it was much more um, uh, visceral, I would say. Well, it's um, a lot of people um, are exposed to that history, but not everyone hears it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I appreciate that you listen and you heard and you clearly learn from it. And so, you know, one thing, I mean, when I, uh, of course, in the last pandemic year, I haven't been traveling that much, but in the years before that, I was traveling all the time. And when I was uh, in a community or on a campus, I always said, asked who was on this ground before? Let's think about vertical history. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, you can tell me maybe the textbooks are better now, but they don't seem to start before the first Europeans showed up. Right? I can assure you they are not better. Um, and they are certainly not better here in North Carolina because they, are, they do not do a very good job here of giving the history within our state, the very rich history of American Indians in North Carolina. So It's, it's to their own deprivation that they don't do that. Yeah. Okay, well, we better stay on task and on focus here. Um, 
So there's been a lot in the media over the past few years and more recently on the very um, public and high profile claims of sexual harassment. There have been lawsuits, criminal and civil trials. Do you feel that women are making substantial strides in that area by standing up, speaking up, fighting back, naming names, pointing out wrongs and wrongdoers, and basically bolstering the Me Too movement? And how does it measure up to where the country seems to stand on sexual harassment today? Mm. Yes, well, simply to have the word sexual harassment. I mean, uh, we previously had the term sexual assault, but mm -hmm. frequently when a woman, you know, came forward with a charge, she was asked, well, why were you in that neighborhood? Why were you wearing those clothes? I mean, it was so much about blaming the victim that uh, it certainly discouraged women from coming forward. I think we now have come to a place where um, the idea that our bodies belong to us and no one has a right to touch our bodies, whether we're male or female, without our permission, has come into being. And also the kind of verbal assaults that, that try to define us by how we look or what we're wearing is, is I think it's much more in the culture now than, than it was. And this applies to men too, of course. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you feel like the feminist movement now is as strong as it was previously? But in, in light of you know what you were just talking about, or is it just different? Mm -hmm. You know, women have the right to vote now, obviously, and. Um, there's a lot of progress that's been made, still a lot of work to do, but so do you feel like that it's just a, it's just a different feminist movement now or that we've made so many advances in gender equality that um, it's no longer a feminist movement? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I, I think people are free to name whatever they, the women's movement, feminist movement, you know, what whatever name they choose. But if you look at our ruling bodies, whether they're state legislatures or Congress, and see how little they resemble the country at large, you can see that we are most definitely not there yet. I mean, we haven't even had a female president. I mean, Shirley Chisholm took the white male only sign off the White House door all by herself. Yeah. <laughs> but she was only on the ballot in 14 states. You know, we there has not been a, a serious uh, possibility of a, a female president. So what do you think should be our priority now? Well, you know, I, I don't think, um, I think each person or group or office or factory or sports team or whatever it is, gets to decide that because it's not the same for for everybody i mean for for a lot of women it's being in a situation where the fathers take care of the children as much as the, as the mothers do uh, for many it's uh, the who's in the boardroom and who's sitting at the desk or where they work or at the factory where they work. I mean, I, it is uh, imbalance, unfairness, wherever we are. Mm -hmm. So Gloria, what's next for you? I mean, you have done everything. I, I you know, um, saw a lot of your interviews and, and read through a lot of your writings in preparation for this. I mean, you're amazing and you have done so much to inspire women, um, uh, you know, across this country, across the world, as far as that's concerned. What's next for you? I mean, you look like you're an incredible shape. For super behind in writing. I mean, you, you know, I hope my editor is not watching. <laughs> <laughs> So this is your lunch break. This is a, this is a lunch break, right? 
No, I, I, I really um, have, given my age, especially, have not written nearly as much as I might have. So I hope to, to focus on that. Uh, personally, um, I would like to go back to India where I lived for two years and it's my second home. I would like to go back there. There are lots of places in Africa where I've not been that, that uh, where I would like to travel. So there, there's no shortage. So what are you writing about? Or what is it that you aspire to still write about? Uh, well, it's a book, a book of essays, really. Um, and the essay is a wonderful form because you can, you know, start, start out in a personal place and end up in a way more universal one. I love that form. Uh, and I'm supposed to be a writer after all, you know, so, <laughs> so I, I hope to continue that. And also, I am lucky to have a living room here in New York City where I live in an old brownstone, a couple of floors in an old brownstone. So I've been having talking circles and, you know, lots of diverse people sitting in a circle, as I was describing, as, as you know, in imitation of probably the Native Americans who were on the same land a long time ago. <laughs> and that is uh, kind of magic. You know, you, you always end up learning and also saying things you didn't know that you could or that you had to say. So do you have a topic that you like pick the topic for the evening when you do that? Uh, some, sometimes if, if they're, you know, you're in a political moment, an election moment, but sometimes it's just bringing diverse mostly women, sometimes some men too, mm -hmm. into the circle and uh, each person talking about what they're doing, what they need and seeing, you know, if we can help to um, complete the endeavors of, of each of us in that room. I mean, talking circles are magic. They they have a life of their own, so they're, they're not all that predictable, but that's part of the magic. Right. That's awesome. So sort of like a book group without the book, you, because yes, it's exactly. like my, my group, book group, exactly. we don't that's usually talk way. very much about the book anyway. We, we talk about everything else. Right. Um, well, that is very cool. And then I guess, um, do you get some ideas for your essays from those discussions that you're having? Yeah. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, ideas about life, essays, you know, the, it's, it's the aha factor <laughs> that's fun and important. So we can be excited about um, another book coming out from you then. Well, I hope so. <laughs> awesome. Well, I've asked you about a lot of, of um, things and I know you're interviewed all the time. Is there something that you thought I would ask you that I didn't, um, that is sort of a common question that, that I missed that you want to share with this group? Well, I'm really glad you didn't ask me about Trump. <laughs> but I, I guess he's sort of out of the question asking picture. Uh, I'm trying to forget. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, I that um, you know there have been lots of people in the White House who we've demonstrated against or celebrated or, <laughs> but this this was the first time that I think we, especially New Yorkers, because ninety six percent of us voted against him, uh, were um, amazed to find was that the, this this was present. So. It feels freeing now. Indeed. Um, well, the other thing that I didn't ask you about, and I'm still not asking, but it is fascinating and intriguing to me is the fact that you did spend time as a Playboy bunny for just a few weeks in an undercover operation mm -hmm. as a journalist. I mean, so um, courageous, I think to do that. Well, that was was not exactly my idea. There was a, a, 
a big, beautiful arts magazine called Show Magazine, which may be people remember or not, I don't know. And I was a contributing editor there, was, so we were sitting in a meeting and, um, and I said, uh, we should send an investigative reporter to be a bunny, the club had just opened here. And it was kind of scandalous because in and of itself, because it forced the waitresses to wear scanty costumes and uh, most of the customers were men. It also uh, had certain organized crime connections. <laughs> so, so, uh, so everyone turned to me and said, you do it. And I said, uh, right. So I said, all right, I'll, I'll just go for the um, interviews interviews means you had to walk around pretending you were holding a tray and high heels and so to write about that because i never dreamed that they would hire me without proper credentials but they were so desperate for employees that they actually hired me so i, I worked there for a, about a month and then wrote about it that i mean that is just incredible and um I hope there are no more. I don't know if people can who are listening can tell me, but I I hope there are no more Playboy clubs. No more what? Playboy clubs. Oh yeah, I don't. I I wouldn't know about that. Um, no idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that's really all the questions that I had for you this afternoon. Um. But I'm just, again, so incredibly thrilled and honored that you would join the state of North Carolina for um, a lunchtime discussion about women's equality. Um, it is really just an incredible honor for me to have this opportunity to interview you. Um, and just thank you so, so much for taking the time to be with us. And thank you for all your hard work. Over Listen, the thank you is on the other foot, so to speak. <laughs> I thank you uh, for all, all right. that you are doing to uh, equalize where you are in the workplace and your own families. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. I appreciate it. I'm going to turn us back over to Nancy A. Strike, who's with our Office of State Human Resources. Thank you, Secretary Cashwell. And on behalf of the Office of State Human Resources, I'd like to thank Gloria Steinem for spending this time with us today. What a treat it has been and a wonderful opportunity to discuss equity, the feminist movement, and really share in Gloria's unbiased hope for the future. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us today. Also, thank you to Secretary Cashwell and Director Gibson for participating in this event. Your presence here today really does underscore uh, your personal commitment to ensuring everyone has equal opportunities and pay and respect for their contributions in the workplace and society in general. So again, thank uh, all three of you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedules to uh, be with us today. And most importantly, I'd like to thank each of you that are listening out there today, either via YouTube or WebEx for joining us today as the Office of State Human Resources recognizes Governor Cooper's proclamation, noting that August 26 is Women's Equality Day in North Carolina. So we thank the governor and his administration for the leadership on this issue. Personally, we hope to see you at our upcoming EEO Lunch and Learn events. Many more are planned for the future, and we wish everyone a very happy and safe afternoon. Thank you all, and we will see you soon.